What's going on guys, Phil DeRue back again with another video. Today I wanna go over some questions that was given to me from a community post that I put out on YouTube. Um, today I'm gonna be talking about assessment protocols for mixed martial arts and for all my fighters that I have at American Top Team. The first question was from Zachary Lelly. It says, hey coach, if there's interest in it, a video on assessments for fighters would be cool. How do you perform these assessments and what ranges of mobility, flexibility, levels of development for aerobic and anaerobic systems, strength and power, et cetera? Thanks for your question, I appreciate it. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna go over my entire assessment protocol from the mobility all the way up into the explosive power work. So stay tuned, let's make it happen. Okay, so before you go and do the movement assessment, you want to make sure that you're getting a full on goal setting analysis done, also understanding the schedule so that you can formulate the program. After that, we go right into the movement assessment I utilize a functional movement screen and a functional range assessment protocol, and then I throw some things in there for the fighters itself for their biomechanics. So the first thing we're gonna be doing is a bilateral squat. Now, I used to do an overhead uh, squat, but I found that just in general, it didn't look too well. Most of the time, a lot of them lack the external rotation and overhead position or the uh, flexion of the shoulder. So, just go ahead and I do a standard bilateral back squat with the hands out in front to counterbalance themselves, okay? The next thing that we're going to be doing is an inline lunge, right? So I'm going to be going over and seeing exactly where their mobility lies in their ankles, their hips, and then also what we can do as far as from a balance perspective from left to right to see where the asymmetries lie in that perspective, okay? The next thing you're gonna do is a side lunge. I do a side lunge because of the lateral component. So when they get in that position, I want to see if they can produce force from the lateral movement pattern. The next thing we're gonna do is a supine straight leg raise. Now this is going to basically find uh, any tightness in the hamstring and then also compensation from the hip. They have uh, compensation patterns in the hip from left to right. We're gonna see that through that, that lying straight leg raise. Okay, the next one is going to be internal and external shoulder rotation. So with a lot of the fighters, like I said before, they lack that rotation of the shoulder, whether it be external, internal. A lot of the times it's more internal rotation that they do have and less external rotation because of the over volume that they get in the anterior chain. A lot of them have a kyphotic posture, they're forward rolled. So what we're going to see here is that especially if you train a lot of fighters, you're gonna see a common occurrence there. So just be ready to make sure that you jot that down if you do see a problem in that external rotation. Another thing that we do is a functional range assessment. Basically, it's a controlled articular rotation. Um, you've seen this in the past videos, and if you haven't, I'll go ahead and put the link above so that you can click on that to see what controlled articular rotations look like. Um, basically, what we're trying to accomplish here is seeing compensation inside that rotation of each joint capsule, whether it be a shoulder, a hip, an ankle, a knee, anything that's going to uh, reflect a bad rotation and then compensation in that rotation so that they can get the full rotation. So a lot of the times when you're talking about, for instance, the shoulder rotation, if they do have bad uh, mobility in that joint capsule, they are going to compensate somewhere in the trunk region or bending of the elbow to uh, minimize that rotation or that circular motion of that, uh, of that movement pattern. The next thing that we're gonna do is to see core strength. So just gonna do a basic plank push-up, right? The plank push-up is actually gonna show me where they have deficiencies from left to right. So if they do a plank push-up and one side goes up faster, usually this is an indication that they are using one side more efficiently than the other. And at that point, we may want to balance that out as long as it's not going to hinder their biomechanics of their own sport. So. That's the assessment for the movement. We're gonna get into the next one, which is going to be the conditioning assessments. Okay, so in order to do the bilateral squat, we're gonna take a dowel or a broomstick, have them hold it in front of their body, taking a shoulder width stance. From there, you're gonna tell them to brace their core, pack their air down, and then descend into the squat. As they go down, make sure you're cueing them to spread the floor apart they want to get about below parallel where their hip crease 
is, is lower than their knees, and then driving up. You're going to do that for about five repetitions, making sure that you're seeing where their ankles, their hips, their low back all are in line. Then you want to go and change your position of where you're watching them from. So start in a 45 degree position, go to the side, and then go to the back side so that you can see in all formations how they're actually performing the squat. Okay? If they are coming up off their heels, primarily it's an ankle or a hip issue, so you can actually place uh, two and a half pound plates on their heels and see if they can do it then. If they can't do that, then obviously we have to work on mobility and other means to get them better at the squat position. Now, if they cannot perform the squat with no load, obviously we're not going to maximal load them for an absolute strength test. You cannot load them if they can't do it with, that, with body weight. Okay, the next one is going to be an inline lunge. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take a hurdle or some type of marker so that they can straddle the marker so that they're close together. The main thing that you wanna see, you're gonna start them in the down position where their knee is in line with their front heel, all right? As you do that, you're gonna tell them to put their hands on their hips, brace their core. From there, you wanna see a straight line coming up, keeping balance, and then back down for five reps, down, up, down, up, down, up, all right? The main thing you're looking for is you don't want them to obviously lose their balance, so core tightness is going to be a key factor too as well, and then as they come down, you want to make sure that their heel does not come off the floor, right? If that does happen, they have limited dorsiflexion or something going on in the hips. So we've got to make sure that we're addressing that problem first before we get into any other loading capacities. So that was the inline lunge. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so for the next one is a side lunge. What you're going to do is take your dowel, right? Hold it in front. Your legs are going to be spread out enough to where you can sit back and hinge and then push all the weight to one side or the other. So the first thing you're going to do is toes are pointed forward. From there, we're going to go to the dominant side. So you're going to hip hinge, sit back, make sure that that far leg is stretched out, driving back up, back into place again. You'll do three reps on one side, making sure that that knee is going out to the side. It's not caving in. The heel isn't coming off the floor like this. The knee isn't shooting forward, right? So the main thing we're going to see here is hip and ankle flexibility or mobility. And then also you want to make sure that they're not compensating in their spine as they go to do this. So no rounding, no heel up, things like that. If you do see that, then obviously that's a problem and it's going to limit your ability to produce force from a lateral position. On to the next one. Okay, so for the next one is a supine straight leg raise. Now we're trying to measure out hamstring flexibility and then we're also trying to see compensation patterns from the left to the right hip as you're going down and moving through this movement. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to sit down on the floor, legs straight out in front of you, toes are pointing straight up, heels are into the ground. You're going to lie on your back <clears throat> with your hands by your side. The opposite side leg of the one that you're moving is pressed down into the floor, making sure that your knee is tight, your heel is pushed into the floor and your toes are staying up. I'm going to go with the right leg first, so I'm driving up as high as I possibly can and then back down, making sure that you're seeing no compensation in the hips or any knee bending as you're going up through the movement. Then back down. Do this for about three repetitions, primarily a good healthy hamstring. You can get to about 70 to 80 degrees of flexion. Um, you want to make sure that, like I said, they're not compensating through anything as far as their hips or their knees go. Um, and also you're not feeling any pain in the low back as they do it as well. So that was the supine straight leg raise. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so for the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to move up to the upper body. We're working on internal external rotation. We're trying to test out and see exactly where that lies, where the deficiencies lie, and then also making sure that we are properly programming it if you do see any type of uh, inflexibility, immobility in the shoulder capsule. So first thing you're going to do, you want to act like you're holding two pieces of paper in your hand. All right. First one is going to go external. So we're going to go with the left and then right. So we're measuring out external rotation of the left arm and internal rotation of the right arm. Then we'll do vice versa, go the opposite way just to see where we're at. So external rotation, we're going to come behind the head. 
internal rotation behind the back. And we're just basically measuring out from thumb tip to thumb tip as far as we can without compensation here in the mid back or TL junction. Okay, do the same thing on the other side. Primarily you want about a hand length um, between the hand. Anything longer than that, obviously we have to work on shoulder mobility. If they can't get their arms back there, then that's an issue. Obviously I need a little bit of work on my internal and external rotation, but at the end of the day, the main thing is that we're getting to see what we need to get done and what we need to improve upon. And then also it gives you a correlation of what you need to do from an exercise uh, parameter standpoint to get them better. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do for seeing shoulder mobility is a functional range assessment controlled articular rotation of the shoulder capsule. So for the basic controlled articular rotation or CARS, we're gonna get in a good position. We're gonna create irradiation tightness inside our entire body. We're gonna pack our air down so nothing else moves, all right? Take the fist, clinch it hard. The other hand's gonna be up. Thumb is up right below the eyes. Then you're gonna come up into flexion, start to shrug the shoulder up, rotate internally of the shoulder, big circle around, driving it all the way down, depressing down once you get towards your hip, then back around again in a big rotation all the way through to the front part of your eyes. Now the main concern that you want to see is if you do see any type of rotation in the trunk or bending of the elbow. If that does happen, obviously they have some tightness in their shoulder, in their T-spine where they have to compensate. So we will go ahead and program corrective exercises and stretches and mobility work to help with that certain dysfunction. Next one. Okay, so for the last movement assessment, we are going to measure out that plank push-up. So what you're gonna do for the males, you're gonna take your arms at a 90 degree angle, thumbs are going to be right at the forehead. You're gonna lay down, making sure the elbows are down, hands are at 90, thumbs are at the forehead. You're gonna make sure you tell them to drive their toes to their shins, lock their knees, create irradiation and core strength by bracing their core as hard as possible. Then from there, they're gonna drive through their forearms and hands up into the upright position. So brace, drive through, back down. Okay, now for the females, they're just gonna have their hands come down slightly to their mouth or their chin area. The main thing that you wanna see is shifting of the hips, any wave-like uh, upright positioning. So as they come up, you don't want to see them obviously wave their body up and down. You want to see a straight line going straight up, straight down as they go through that plank push-up. Okay, that was the last movement assessment. Now we're going to go on to the VO2 max test. Okay, so for the next assessment protocol, we're going to be working on the aerobic capacity for the baseline test. So what I like to use is the VO2 max test. Now I know that this doesn't have high correspondence to a fight, but it's a good measuring tool, a baseline measuring tool to manage out what we need to do. And also it helps with formulating the program when it comes down to energy system demands. So what I use is a beep test and you can use this because it's non-invasive and it's a field test. It's very easy to do. Um, I use an app called BT Light and it's a 20 meter test. Okay. So what you're going to basically have them do is do a five minute warm up, either a jog or maybe some shadow boxing, something along the lines of that, right? You want them to have a heart rate monitor on, preferably a polar strap with an app there that, so that you can monitor it as you go along in the test, okay? You need to make sure that your measuring is consistent with the aerobic demands so that utilizing that heart rate monitor, you're actually gonna see where they jump in increases in their heart rate, okay? Another thing is that you want to make sure that you're measuring out those 20 meters um, very, very strict so that it doesn't skew the test in any way, shape or form. OK, uh, for the average on the females, the scores are usually around stage 11. Right. That's putting them somewhere around a 33.5 VO2. All right. And then for the males, it's a stage 14, putting them around 55.5 VO2. All right. So primarily what we're trying to accomplish here after I get 
that VO2 max, I can correlate that into their maximal aerobic speed, and then we can make sure that we're systematically putting the protocols together so it matches their particular uh, avail availability or ability to produce oxygen. When um, in time, the beeps are gonna get lessened, so you have to run a little faster, right? The main thing is you gotta make it to the cone before the beep. If you don't make it before the cone before the beep, you only got one more time to get back. Then I restart it. Keep pushing, keep pushing. Good, again, come on, come on, let's go. Get to the end, get to the end, come on. Don't miss this one, go, finish fast, finish fast. Get there, get there, get there, come on. Okay, so for the next test, we're gonna be measuring our anaerobic threshold. Now, I know that a lot of people cannot get into a lab to do a full-on blood marker test. So, what we do is a non-invasive field test, and this is to measure out that VT2, right, to see where that threshold is and where we need to train it to be optimal when it comes down to progressions. So, we're gonna use a Conconi test, okay? You're gonna use this on a treadmill, all right, basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna need a heart rate monitor, you're gonna need somebody with you to jot down time and also heart rate in time. And I'll talk more about that in a second, right? You wanna get a warm up of 10 minutes so that your body is heated up, you're sweating a bit, uh, so you're not going into it cold, okay? You're gonna start at a comfortable speed, about 0.5 miles per hour, nothing crazy, all right? At the end of two minutes, take note of your heart rate, right then increase the speed by 0.5 miles per hour okay you're going to repeat that continuously until you see no dramatic increases in your heart rate or the fighter is at its maxed out point okay the test should last no longer than 30 minutes plot a scatter type graph of heart rate against time initially it should follow a linear progression and then offshoot once it deflects that's the point of your anaerobic threshold heart rate. Make sure you jot that time down and make sure that you have it ready so that you can utilize it going further in your camp. So on average, females are gonna be about 165 to maybe 170 beats per minute. Male average is going to be 175 to 180 beats per minute. Now this is obviously going to vary if you have a fighter that's highly fit, that has a, the ability to go for longer rounds, but it's a good indication, a good standalone baseline measurement to see what we need to do to progress from there. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the lower body explosive power testing. We're gonna be using a broad jump, a bilateral broad jump for this one. All right, you're gonna need measuring tape and then you're also gonna need a marker so that you can plot your landing. Now you're gonna take three attempts take the best of three attempts. The way you're gonna do it is you're obviously gonna stand bilateral, right? Feet about shoulder width or in a jumping position with your feet forward and flat on the floor, right? You're gonna make sure that your hands come up, you drop the hands back down, arms to the hips, and then shoot the body forward into a horizontal jump, making sure that you're landing on both feet, not staggering forward. And then you wanna make sure that you're getting that line at the base of the heel. So the heel is where the landing mark is. Make sure you measure that out there, right? Um, on average, females get about five foot 11 inch jump. For the males, it's around a seven foot 11 inch, or I should say seven foot 10 inch jump. Um, primarily the best overall jump that I've seen was from Will Brooks who is a PFL fighter and he's one of the most athletic fighters in the gym. He actually got an 11 foot jump. So this is somewhat of obviously above average, if not excellent jump. A lot of the NFL guys get those numbers. So for that, I would say, you know, females, a good range is around a six to an eight foot and the males is going to be somewhere around an eight to nine foot jump. And that's going to be highly athletic for those people to do that. So. That was the broad jump, on to the next one. Okay, so for the next one that you're gonna be doing for the contralateral lower body explosive power is going to be the single leg lateral broad jump. Now this is a little bit more sport specific because a lot of the fighters, when you're talking about movement, we're moving primarily laterally. So what I wanna see is, I wanna see good force production from that one leg in that lateral position. So what you're gonna do is, you're gonna take that measuring tape and markers to mark down where you've landed. You're gonna take two attempts on each leg and get the best out of those two attempts, okay? You're gonna start with your legs staggered where the dominant foot, whether it be a southpaw, it's going to be obviously the left leg is going to be in front, 
if you're a righty then or an orthodox, you're going to be the right foot is going to start in front. The, uh, the foot is going to make sure that it's hovering behind the line. You're going to make sure that you get that one foot off the ground. You're going to load that hip up and push off, turning 90 degrees and landing on two feet. We're going to take the marker and measure where the heels land. Okay, you're going to take two attempts there as well. Now, primarily with fighters, I do see more um, of an overall distance as opposed to the bilateral broad jump because they move in that fashion all the time. So they're stronger in the lateral movement. So on average, I see about six feet, five inches there. And then on average for the males, it's about eight feet, seven inches. And again, the best uh, overall uh, distance I've seen was again from Will Brooks, who did get a 10.5. So that's 10 feet, five inches on a single leg lateral jump. Now, I know that's impressive, but you got to take into account they are moving that way in high volumes, in high frequencies every day. So it's a good indication to show maximal force and explosive power in that hip, that glute, and that tie-in from the thigh all the way up from that lateral position. So that was the single leg lateral broad jump. On to the next one. Okay, so for the upper body, we're gonna be measuring out the explosive power of the upper extremities. So seated med ball throw or a med ball chest pass, right? So basically what you're gonna need is for the females, a four kilogram ball, med ball, or for the males, an eight kilogram med ball. You're gonna take your back to the wall, make sure you have measuring tape to measure out the distance thrown. Your back is gonna be against the wall with your feet straight out and 24 inches apart, okay? From there, you're gonna take the ball, place it on the chest with the elbows tucked in, right by your side, and then explode through, pressing the ball 45 degrees out horizontally, making sure that your back does not leave the wall when you go to throw the ball. Okay, for the female average is going to be about 16 feet and the male average is going to be about 22 feet. Anything more than that, then obviously you're going to be above average or excellent. Okay, so have my back against the wall. My feet are 24 inches apart. Take the med ball, put it to my chest. Elbows are in tucked in tight. Throw the ball through, take a big breath in. Throw straight through. Make sure that the back don't leave the wall or at least minimizing this going forward. Take that for three times, get the best out of three. There you go. Okay, so for the next one, for the upper body is going to be working on that rotational power. So we're gonna measure out rotational power through the rotational power ball throw, right? Now that's gonna measure your core strength and like I said, that rotational power of the transverse abdominals. So for the females, you're gonna take a two kilogram ball. For the male, it's gonna be a four kilogram ball. You're gonna stagger your feet just like in a fighting position with your hands both on the ball at the same time. Okay, you're gonna rotate back slightly, right? Not rotating all the way, but just a slight rotation, loading up the hip and then pivoting through, throwing the ball at a 45 degree angle going forward. Make sure that they don't fall over the line and make sure that they don't dip too far to where it's like a shot put, right? We want to make sure we're mimicking that overhand throw just like they would with the med ball throws, all right, when you're working your explosive power work. So what you're going to do is they're going to take that ball, boom, throw it 45 degrees. You measure two times on each side, right, and take the best out of two times. Now, the average for the females is going to be 30, uh, 30 feet. And that's going to be on the dominant side. Usually it's about 26 on the non-dominant side. And then the male average is going to be 50 on the dominant side and around 45, 44 on the non-dominant side. So that's a good indication, a good assessment tool to measure out how well they're exploding through. And then from there, you can take that baseline test and retest it to see how much they improved on their explosive power coming from the transverse plane. Okay, so for the last test, we're going to be working with the strength endurance test. Now, I got this from Joel Jamis's circuit. You can find it on 8weeksout.com. I'll also put the link in the description for the full video. But basically, what you're going to be doing is a series of exercises, and you're going to get a one-minute break in between six of those exercises to measure out your full strength endurance. Now, this is important because a fight usually lasts either 15 to 25 minutes. So we're going to make sure that they have the efficiency to do work inside that time frame. So 
The first one is going to be a one kilometer row, right? On average for the females, it's going to be around three minutes and 40 seconds. For the males, it's going to be around three minutes and 20 seconds. They're going to take a minute break and then they're going to go on to the Woodway Force. Or if you don't have that, you can do a 90 pound sled for the males and a 45 pound sled for the females. They're going to run with that for 500 yards. Okay, now the average for the females is going to be five minutes and the average for the males is going to be somewhere around four minutes. Okay, take another minute break. Then they're going to go on to the endless rope. If you do not have that apparatus, you can use a sled rope pull. So basically you're going to tie a rope, a long battle rope to a, a prowler or a sled. Make sure that it has zero weight on it if it is a prowler. If it's just a sled from Elite FTS, you can put 15 pounds or a 15 pound plate on the sled and have them pull that as well. All right. They're going to do that for 1300 feet. So it's a long distance. On average, it's going to take the females around six minutes. And on average for the males, it's going to take them around five minutes. OK, so after you take that minute break, you're going to jump on the Jacobs ladder or you can do a sled bear crawl. If you don't have a Jacobs ladder, you can do it with a 45 pound uh, sled for the males. And then for the females, it's going to be 25 pounds. So we'll put a 25 pound plate on the sled. You're going to do that for 500 feet. Now, on average for the females, it's going to be six minutes. And on average for the males, it's going to be five minutes. OK, take the one minute break again. You're going to go right into the spin bike. You're going to do two miles on a resistance of 10. OK, the average is going to be around four minutes and 20 seconds for the females. And for the males, it's going to be around three minutes. OK, take that minute break. And lastly, this is going to be somewhat a uh, very taxing for them. Right. It's the last round. Um, it's the last round, just like it would be in a fight. So you're using your entire body with this Versa climber. So for the Versa climber, it's going to be 800 meters, right? On average, the females finish within four minutes. And on average for the males, they finish around three minutes. Now, if you total it all up, depending on what you have here, right? You're talking about 24 to 26 minutes for the average for females and 22 to 24 minutes for males. Um, is the average total amount. Now, if you look at this, this is sim you know, similar to an entire fight, especially in the championship rounds. So what you want to do is get a baseline test of that, do it again within four to six weeks, see increases in overall time, making sure that they're bringing down the entire time that they get it done and uh, see from there. So this entire system is my protocol when I get fighters ready um, to go into camp. We usually do this around nine weeks out. Then we do it again around three weeks out right before they start to taper. Right. Thanks again for watching. If you have any, any questions, make sure you hit the comment below. Also, I'm going to put the link in the description for you to ask questions on that community page or that post that I put up. Also, make sure you hit subscribe so you get new videos like this each and every week and make sure you get the notifications so you know when those videos come out. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.